Well, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for joining us on uh, Indie Inside. We're, we're glad to have you here. Good morning. Thank you for yeah. having me. And before we went on the air, we were just talking about the last time you were in this studio was as candidate Mobilade, and now you're mayor of Mobilade. It's been a whirlwind, I, I bet. It has been a whirlwind. It's good to be back here. And just so you know, you can also call me Mary Yemi. Okay. Yeah, since most people know me as Yemi. I'll, I'll do that. And um, mobile, I'm, by the way, well done. I'm being able to say, say my last did name. Did I say it right? It's, it's actually, it's a lot easier than people think. But if you've never pronounced it, it can feel it can feel hard. So, yeah. well done. Mobile Lade. Take notes, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, let's start off super easy. Tell me about, you know, your your first few days in Ottawa. Well, it's a couple months now, right? Yeah, two yeah. and a half months. Two and a half months. Um, it's good. Yeah. I, I still wake up in the morning and pinch myself and, you know, to, is this real? Yeah. Uh, it is real. And I'm still mayor of this great city. Yeah. Um, the story and the impact that's hap- happened, um, um, not just across the state, but in the nation and the world is truly profound. Yeah. We have put Colorado Springs on a map yeah. in a really special way. And I'm truly humbled and honored for this opportunity to serve, yeah. which is super important for me to say that way. I, it truly is um, public service. And, and yeah. your win got national attention, maybe even international. I don't it know. Did. Did it, it did. It, it, did, it did both. Yeah. And it's still, it's still getting that attention. Yeah. Um, um, the... As I've shifted from my campaign team to the city team, they are getting those um, requests and interest. And I, I, Brian, what's really important for me to say is mm-hmm. it's not um, this win that has given me national attention. I think it's a given our city national attention, mm-hmm. and it's open doors for us. Yeah. So one of the one of the doors now, I would say that as afforded to us is whenever. Um, Denver is invited to the table whenever Mayor Johnston is invited to the table mm-hmm. for something with a group of Colorado leaders or business leaders or state leaders, yeah. I'm usually invited as well. Yeah. So I, I get to help advocate and to represent Colorado Springs in many of these spaces. And the hope is while I'm, uh, I, to be at the table so that I can take advantage of those opportunities mm-hmm. to come back to our city. We, we get our own fair share. Yeah. Yeah. What does it say about Colorado Springs, maybe pre-Mayor Yemi and now post-Mayor, that this was such a big deal and that, you know, there are mayor races all over the country right. that don't get national attention, don't get international attention. Uh, from a city perspective, why why do you think this happened? I think it's truly special. Um, I was in D.C. probably about four weeks ago-ish, mm-hmm. advocating for Colorado Springs, and I was able to meet with so many congressional leaders from all sides of the aisle. Um, and most of them looked at me and said, yeah, we, we, we heard your story. We're paying attention. Yeah. Even, the, even the president of the United States also said, you know, towards the tail end of the campaign, they were following at the White House. I just think it's, um, Brian, I'm, I'm such a work, workaholic that I'm already in let's go mode. And so it's helpful for me to take some time to pause and reflect of, around the why and what yeah. we did, not just me. And if I, and th- so this is a good moment for me to do that. But I, I think um, what, what it's, this is not just a West African immigrant becoming mayor of the 39th largest city in the Colorado Springs. No, this, this, this is a story of promise. Mm-hmm. It's a story of hope. It's a story of inspiration. It's the, it's a, it's a story of celebrating the American dream mm-hmm. and what's possible, especially in this political landscape mm-hmm. where many people are just fed up. I think for the first time in a long time, people are lifting their heads going, hmm. And they're also saying, we like how that city did it. Yeah. And what I mean is that we, even as I've transitioned to governance, I've engaged some of my uh, opponents mm-hmm. in the decision making process of the future of our city. People are looking at to us and saying, that's good politics. Mm-hmm. That's good governance. This is what we're hungry for. So we got to tell that story nationally and globally. Mm-hmm. I think you've talked about Abraham Lincoln, right? Being one of your, yeah, your role right, models you politically. That. Yeah, right. And right. because he invited opposing views to the table. He was genius. I mean, that was truly one of the uniqueness of his um, leadership. And why not? Mm-hmm. Why not? I mean, two things. I, I see worth and value in the people that are uh, opponents. And not just the people I ran against. Even as I approach issues mm-hmm. as mayor, I engage 
my what you call traditional op- opponents or enemies because they have worth. Yeah. They have something to learn from them. They have something to contribute to the conversation. There's a reason why they're also passionate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then two, Abraham Lincoln was also genius knowing that if I can win that person over, I'm winning their group yeah. of supporters over. Why not? Yeah. Uh, so it's about 75 days in office. Uh, what, what's gone to plan so far? Uh, so in five days, two and a half months, um, there's a lot that has gone to plan. Mm-hmm. Um, the, one of the f- biggest feedback I'm getting from people consistently is, Yemi, you're actually doing everything you said you're going to do. And I would usually respond and say, I didn't realize there was n- another option. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's also some of the distrust that the community have with politicians mm-hmm. um, like me. And I would say that what's gone well is that we are doing a lot of things um, not only well, but the things that I said I was going to do, yes. I mean, sp- um, Space Command, we heard that news. Um, yep. I said I was going to engage the neighborhoods. We're, we're having neighborhood meetings. Um, public safety was a top priority for me. Mm-hmm. We got that measure passed yesterday at City Council. So there's a, there's a lot that's going well. I brought the mayor's office to the community. I created a, um, the Office of Community Affairs. And I'm just really proud of the work um, my entire team and this community is mm-hmm. is doing. Any surprises the other way? Any any sort of challenges you didn't expect? Um, I would say the biggest challenge is um, there's only one of me. Yep. I my career in this community is is is, is built on being a leader who's accessible. Mm-hmm. I I level the playing field. I have relationships with. You know, people all the way to the top to people all the way to the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm a, so because of I'm an accessible leader, um, it means sometimes ten times the amount of work yeah. than perhaps even other mayors have had. And so the demands on my schedule is a lot. And trying to manage that, and also for the community to be okay with people that are representing me, yeah. and they have they have direct access to me, and they also carry an equal amount of influence and it's okay to engage them as well. Yeah. But we have a we have a long backlog of people <laughs> that want to meet with me and we will get through them, but it pains me that, you know, some right now as we're reaching out to folks, it's like October. Yeah. You know, so what we're looking at as soon as we can actually meet. We so wanted this to be a five hour podcast. <laughs> but you said that yeah, but we'll we, only give you an hour. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for doing your part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do what we can. Um, are you concerned about that pace? I mean, you've got, oh, you got that's, this that's, is a marathon, that's, right? That's a, yeah. I need to take, I, I need to take that. It's interesting you ask that mm-hmm. because I feel like I've been hearing that consistently from so many people. So it makes me go, hmm, hmm. I need to listen to that. Um, I've sat with elected officials from across the state. Um, the former mayor of Denver, um, mm-hmm. he wanted to give me some words of wisdom. And everyone's asking me the same question. Is this pace sustainable? Yeah. So I need to pay attention to that. Um, perhaps not. Um, I, I'm, one of my weaknesses is I'm a workaholic by nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and the strength finders, Clifton strength finders, achiever is my number one strength. Um, I think it's necessary that I utilize that strength in the first 100 days. People mm-hmm. are watching. I think folks want to know, can this mayor deliver? Yeah. Um, so I'm okay with the pace for now. But I think there's wisdom after the first 100 days. After, you know, I have something to prove. Let's, okay, I've proven that. Maybe we can take the foot off the the gas um, mm-hmm. a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. I think my team would probably also appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of your first public acts as mayor, uh, you, you unveiled a 100-day blueprint. Um, and I thought, and you, you touched on pieces of that. Uh, right. Can you elaborate about what uh, that blueprint entailed and... The, the progress you've made so far. Right. A leader's uh, first 100 days is everything mm-hmm. because, um, like, people are watching that first 100 days. Mm-hmm. Did we make the right decision is what they're asking. Mm. Uh, I'm proud to say so many people across the community have said yes. Even the the the, the people that didn't vote for me. Yeah. The people that, that um, maybe even have a more, have a more, a more challenge, uh, um, have a more challenging relationship with them, I have said yeah, um, he's doing the work. Mm-hmm. The first 100 days is also important because 
it's the greatest opportunity a leader has to get a lot of quick wins. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing. And I want to ride that wave to ensure that we can deliver for the next four years. So I, I, I set out 42 items. Um, they're bold and ambitious and aggressive. 42 items for as a nod to the 42nd mayor. We are, I believe we're about 50% or more completed. Most of them are in progress. Mm-hmm. Uh, September 14, the state of the city, my first state of the city address uh, concludes my 100 days. Okay. You can't make that stuff up. Yeah. That date was decided last year, way before um, um, the election cycle. That was not intentional? It was not intentional. Okay, that's good As timing. I looked at the conclusion <laughs> of my first 100 days, mm-hmm. it was going to be the state of the city. So we're looking forward, and I'm looking forward to reporting out to the community everything that we, mm-hmm. that's really important, not just me, that we have accomplished. So I mentioned that we are in the middle of um, the listening tour. Mm-hmm. Those are, that's going really well. There were 230 people at the District 3 um, listening session last Friday. Was that for space? That was Space Command related? No. Or? no so, that's um, so yeah, let me just, the, the listening tour, and I should just put in a plug real. Sure, yeah, well, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm doing it in partnership with every um, city council member's district. Got it. So six districts, one virtual one. And this is where we're going to each district to engage in neighborhoods and in the future of the city. That mm-hmm. information is going to be used for the city's new strategic plan, which should be done June of next year. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we're making our rounds. I said we're going to do that, and that's what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the the part of the way through that you you said there? Are, there's a few in progress. With some of the, the few items in progress. Are, mm-hmm. um, Housing is one of them. Yep. Um, I, I appointed a chief housing officer, um, Steve Posey, to yep. elevate the housing conversation and ensure there's a direct line um, of um, access towards me. Mm-hmm. Um, Steve is engaging the philanthropy community, engaging um, the housing um, folks just to ensure that we are staying ahead of the game. Mm-hmm. Ahead of the game for me is ensuring that we are exploring new ways of building homes, uh, especially around that missing middle income earners. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a huge focus of mine. Steve is also working on on um, my homelessness initiatives. We, uh, we're also kicking off a, a new strategic plan around that. Um, other things are in the works are solutions teams. Um, I have uh, four different teams of about 15 community leaders, very diverse. Um, they're all gathered around the areas of public safety, housing, like we've talked about, um, infrastructure and economic vitality. So these teams of diverse leaders uh, are going to deliver two-page um, recommendations to the mayor's office in terms of these are the ways mm. um, you solve these problems. These are what you should be implementing as you are leading for the next four years. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to do that very early in the in the in the in the process. So those are happening um, as we speak. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned homelessness, and I know that was a, a huge part of your your campaigning and part of your public safety right. uh, focus. Um, so I'll I'll get into some specific questions here. Uh, the paper that's actually on the streets now, the indie that's that's on the racks right now. Uh, Pam Zubek wrote an article. Uh, called Hotspot, and it talked about the Launchpad, which is this new project to try right. to transition young adults out of homelessness. Right. Uh, the the planned spot for it is 19th and Dale, so that's near U- Uenta, toward the west side. Um, the article addressed surrounding businesses and sort of the concerns they have with the existing homeless population. There was a murder reported there two days ago uh, right across the street from where the launch pad is supposed to be built. So my question is, what are your thoughts about uh, crime and homelessness in that area, especially now that we're talking about a project right. to address homelessness? Um, and then how do you identify sort of these hot spots throughout the city? Because that's not the only one. Right. Uh, and, and what do you do about that? Right. I, I'm glad you, 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 your latter statement is not the only one. Mm-hmm. Uh, many, many pockets of our community are experiencing the homeless crisis, homeless challenges. There's two parts of that story. Yeah. Um, one is that we we must celebrate the work that is being done. When you look at the point in time count, we uh, we've dropped about three, four hundred. Uh, we've gone from about sixteen hundred to about thirteen hundred. So we're back to the 2016 numbers. Mm-hmm. 
But 1,300 people still need help. Yeah. So um, we we have to look at, we also have to look at what's working. And that that um, those data points show us that the transition into housing has also gone up. Mm-hmm. And it's housing with wraparound services. As a candidate, I mentioned permanent supportive housing. So this is a work of launch pad. So we look at that area in, in the west side, and they are... Um, experiencing challenges that are not even connected to Launchpad. Correct. So I want to separate both of those conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the concern about the area. It's a concern and, about and the, the area. population that would be surrounding exactly. it. Exactly. Right. So actually, I, I actually want to propose that the Launchpad project will actually take care of some of the challenges hmm. that the residents are experiencing because historically we know permanent supportive housing comes with services. Yeah. It comes with um, security. It comes with behavioral health services. So it, we're, we're moving mm-hmm. the homeless conversation towards actually meaningful solutions. Yeah. So I actually would argue that that project really will help keep that neighborhood safer compared to what we're experiencing right now. Because the reality is we have residents who are mentally... Um, challenge whether mm-hmm. and you know challenges with uh, substance abuse mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> living in a land like ours as uh, the uh, that it's a free country yeah you know trying to strike that balance between um, providing help and forcing people to get help sure but if we can get if we have more and more projects like launchpad where we have a process to getting people that help mm-hmm. I actually see we'll make uh, we'll be making a difference in um in our community shout out to um beth rawlstad too and the work she's doing with the commons that's also mm-hmm. um a permanent more uh, that's also a permanent supportive housing and as mayor i hope to champion most of those longer term solutions yeah. to the homeless challenges that we're experiencing and you're going to see a lot of not in my backyard with projects like right. that is there an alter- a viable alternative i mean do you uh, to, to the residents and I guess the business owners in that area, and I and our, uh, you, you said you don't think it would exacerbate the problem; it could actually help it. Um, would you say that if it were located anywhere in the city, or is there something no, about that's, the west? No, that's side? A, I, to the residents that have concerns about projects in your neighborhood. I'm going to plug in my computer while you're answering. No worries. <laughs> uh, I'm 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 going to take it as that you don't you don't think my answer is that important, and uh, <laughs> you're, I'm, I'm, that's okay. I'm, I just want to ask four questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, you can be you can be in politics. You can be a political leader and be easily offended. Um, We're journalists. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> Very good point. So it goes both ways. Cheers um, to the residents that are concerned about these projects. It's really important for me to say I hear you. Mm-hmm. I live in a vibrant neighborhood, and I don't want to lose that vibrancy. That is the heart of the pushback. Mm-hmm. The heart of the pushback is also ensuring that we have the infrastructure for these development projects. Yes, I hear you, Mm -hmm. and we'll keep working on that, and we'll we'll keep improving even the way we do community engagement. The other side of the conversation is these projects are essential to the future success of our city. Mm -hmm. If we wanna take care of homelessness and these longer term solutions, it's going to be just trying to get more officers or homeless outreach program managers, you know, moving them towards services or even cleanups. We will keep working on our cleanups and illegal camping because that's a very important part of the solution As because I don't want residents to not feel safe using the trail yeah. system. But in terms of how we actually take care of the problem, permanent supportive housing, wraparound care, these are the things that actually work. They've been proven. And then we also talk about housing for my kids. And, the, and the, many of the kids in our city and the, and the grandkids and our future workforce, we also have to provide those housing because if we don't, this has real implications to our quality of life as well. Yeah. So um, I think as a city, what we need to do better is how we engage our residents in these conversations in and in, 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 um, in these decisions as well as tell a new story. One of my desires, Brian, is to do um, a citywide ha- um, campaign that just tells the story of housing. Mm. So we're not just telling the story of development, we're telling the story of housing, the lives that are impacted teachers, our military family members, our firefighters, the pillars of our community. Mm-hmm. Those are the people most affected with these projects that are, that are being that we're pushing back against. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, let's stick with public safety. Another big issue, and we also wrote about this. I'll just shout out the paper uh, as much as possible. Uh, the cover story, I think, last week was uh, titled Packed, and it was about the police academy. Um, Pack? Packed, yeah. Mm, packed. It had a bunch oh. of police and a sardine can on the cover. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> if, if you could talk about... Uh, where you've you've gone in front of city council, maybe you could talk about that experience and what is going on with the police academy, and how this expanding you know the ability to train really, police yeah. is part of public safety and, right. and what you're working toward. Um, first of all, pro- public safety is is um, is broad. Mm-hmm. The the challenges are many, and the solutions are many. There's no one solution that fits all the many challenges. We we have to even as we talk about addressing and increasing our response time and improving retention and recruitment, which is what this new academy will help us deliver on. Hmm. It's also really important that it's not just responding. We need to get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. Community-based programs and partnership with organizations like Men of Influence, which Dee and I have started those conversations. Dee Smith, um, I should say, which Dee I'm talking about. Uh, So I just want to mention it's comprehensive solutions. I'm really proud of city council, and I'm grateful for the many supporters and diverse community members that came yesterday in support of this project, mm-hmm. um, the, in support of this initiative for the November ballot. It passed 7 to 1 yesterday, so I'm celebrating that. Um, from a new mayor perspective um, that is going through this process for the first time, I'm also celebrating that win. Yep. It's, it's strong, and I want to ride that win all the way to the November 7th ballot. Mm-hmm. The police academy, we're limited. Yes, you're right, it's packed. Frankly, it's sad and embarrassing. It's a job where that has high accountability. Mm-hmm. The weight of the badge is heavy. We expect a lot out of these uh, women and men who wear that badge every day. It's upon us as a community to give them the tools. Mm-hmm. We can't talk with both sides of our mouth and say, well, we're gonna hold you accountable, and by the way, we're not gonna give you the tools to be able to do the job well. Mm-hmm. I think it's upon us to ensure that we are giving them the tools to do their job, especially in today's public safety reality. Mm-hmm. As we talk about transparency, as we talk about de-escalation, as we talk about as the many of the calls that I've seen firsthand, over half of them, are behavioral health related. Mm-hmm. So we must ensure that we're not only the ability to train our new recruits, but the ongoing training of our current officers to ensure that they are equipped to do the job for today. What What is the proposal? What do they need? For this project? Yeah. And so, so, um, when you, so the city, part of my job as mayor is to also assess um, our city facilities. Um, we have to ensure that we, we have the, that infrastructure so that we can actually do our job. The police... Academy, the current police academy, rises up to, uh, to the top two needs, mm. facilities needs in our com- in our city. Just to keep up with the maintenance of that facility, it's, it's, it's very costly yeah. to the taxpayers. So we're trying to address this top need. And the five million, the 4.75, um, three quarter million dollar ask this November for the Tabor excess revenue retention retention mm-hmm. thank you is a way of paying for that it's not that we're not going to pay for all of it mm. but as a good steward of our taxpayer dollars it's upon me to ensure that we're able to be creative in how we pay for this potentially 20 million dollar project it could be anywhere from 12 million to 40 million so i'm i'm trying to stack the funding mm. and so this 5 million dollars gets us it gets it helps pay for a piece of it. Get you started exactly. Yeah, and and the cost differential that depended on whether or not you were going to uh, take over an existing facility or exactly. Build well from said. The it sounds up. like you've been paying attention. Yeah, I, I, I read the story. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so if we took over an existing facility mm-hmm. that is the right facility, <clears throat> we're looking at about twelve to twenty million. Mm-hmm. If we just purchase land and try to build from ground up, we're looking about um, potentially thirty-five to forty million. Yeah. Um, yeah, give or take. So that's 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 the entire cost. But depending on each route, um, my goal is just to try to see if we can 
pay for it as much as possible with minimal impact to our residents. Mm. So that's why it's like, why not? I mean, this is this is five million dollars because either way, the taxpayers are going to be affected. Sure. But we have this excess money. Mm-hmm. There's there's nothing that says we can't ask ask our residents. Right. If the money belongs to them, it belongs to them, and let's give them a voice in the decision making process. You know, public safety is a public concern. So therefore, let the public have a decision mm-hmm. in how, if they want to use this money to address the public safety concern. And I think the refund came to be about about twenty dollars per. Well said. Taxpayer. Yeah, twenty right? twenty one dollars. Twenty one twenty one dollars. Yeah, yes. and and for it, um, it's a refund on your utility account mm-hmm. if you have a utility account. So not every household actually is going to see the impact. Right. Of that twenty-one dollar, and if you live in an apartment, it's the apartment owner and not the person paying. Not the, the person, right? Exactly. So each individual in an apartment complex wouldn't see that. And it's a wisdom. It's a wisdom of um, the wisdom of asking the voters every time this opportunity comes. Mm-hmm. Is first of all, from a government perspective, and this is a process I I use as the first option is always refund the money. Yeah, people need to know that. That's where I was. Mm-hmm. That was the first option. And then we looked at the $21 and thought, not every household benefits, it's a small amount, but the whole city could benefit Mm -hmm. from the ability for the city to do something good with that money. So this is a process, decision-making process, and that's how I came to where I felt like training is something everyone should be able to align on, Mm -hmm. um, agree on, that we just need, like our officers deserve good training and better training. Okay. Uh, last public safety question, I think. Um, <laughs> so Lahaina on Maui uh, just had um, worst yeah. worst fire in you know modern American history in a hundred years. Yeah, and uh, we're not strangers to that right. here in Colorado Springs. What are we going to learn from Maui? Yeah, I. Um, that's, that's, this one is this was really important to me too. Um, upon hearing this news, um, I was actually able to reach out to the mayor's office in Maui um, to express my condolences Mm -hmm. and my support. And they were blown away that I called. They just couldn't wrap their heads around it. Like another mayor would call. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Um, yeah, we're no strangers to fire. Um, This has affected my city. And we see you. We're thinking about you. So what this has done is that it's brought, of course, every time there's a news of fire and a community has been affected, not just in Maui, when it happened in in Northern California, Mm -hmm. when it happened in Boulder. I think we all have PTSD (laughs) in the city. I was... Canada's going through that right now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it's a renewed, it's a, it's, it's good, Brian, in a sense that it's, there's a renewed interest. Mm. So I met with Andrew, who's the head of our office of emergency management, and he's killing it. And when we met, one of the things I asked him was, okay, let's talk about fire drills. Mm. How are we doing that? How are we doing? How are we assessing our readiness? So a lot of this conversation around fire lives in a world of fire mitigation. Yeah. Super important. We need to increase our efforts to prevent fire. Um, also, the world of fire also lives in with development. Many neighbors are saying no more because we want to make sure that we can't evacuate safely. Right. Those are really important. The third one I really want to push is if in the case we don't want there to be, so as we talk about evacuation, are we ready? It's mm-hmm. one thing to have plans and another thing to ensure your plans are working. So sure. I, I, want to, I want to increase um, fire drills. We're doing them every year. I feel like it just kind of gets lost. No one's really talking about that. It affects a certain number of neighborhoods. Um, I also have asked... What's our scorecard? How do we know we're, we're, what? How we measure success? And if we're not there, how are we following up um, to ensure that we're ready? Mm-hmm. So that's that's going to be a renewed emphasis on that. Um, at the at the risk of not overworking my people from this work taskmaster, I've uh, I've I've held off and okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, uh, maybe another year or two. Maybe we we'll do one, and then I want to increase. The frequency, because I want to put it in the forefront of our residents to be ready. Mm. If God, you know, God forbid, but if that happens, we're ready. Yeah, just like we do fire drills in buildings. 
you know, it's you been know, a while. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's wisdom around, yeah, you know, practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, practice yeah. makes perfect. So I'm thinking citywide. And, and well, and good trans. How how important to you is uh, even beyond citywide because fire knows no boundaries. So you know, Manitou mm-hmm. Springs. I live in Palmer Lake, which is wild wildland urban interface, which is the scariest word right now. Uh, monument. You know, Black Forest was mostly county when it caught fire. Right. So. Uh, if not entirely county, how how prepared are we to a regional, city support, regional, yeah, right. regional response? So first of all, um, this interview is over because you, you, don't, <laughs> you don't live in Colorado Springs. No, I don't. So I don't even know why I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I knew I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, no. Uh, here's the good news. Um, I feel like uh, our fire departments are leading the way. Um, and I, I also look forward to even greater collaboration with all um, police departments, too. Mm-hmm. So because you're right, fire knows no boundaries. There are two things we've done well. The Office of Emer- Emergency Management is no longer a city and county. Mm-hmm. It's a joint office. Right. So Andrew, um, who, though his role is at the city, also we have he has a dual reporting structure. Mm-hmm. He also has bosses at the county. His two deputy chiefs. For his office, one is hired by the city. The other one is hired by the two county. Two bosses, poor guy. Yeah. No, yeah, two bosses and yep. then two uh, reports. Yeah. Direct reports from two different organizations. Pay him twice. So it's, it's a, it's, it takes a special person. Mm. This is why I'm proud of his leadership. It takes a special person to navigate those dynamics. But it's essential we look at our, our ability to respond from a regional-wide mm-hmm. solution and not just city or county, because like you said, it knows no boundaries. Okay, that's number one. Number two, in case you hadn't heard, and I'm drawing a blank on the official name, um, about four weeks ago, I gave some opening remarks to this new coalition of fire departments from Palmer Lake, Colorado Springs, Manitou, um, for the same reason. So all the chiefs came together uh, under this banner, one banner, and I'm drawing a blank on the name, but the whole the whole essence of coming together is to ensure that we are communicating, we're working together because fire knows no boundaries. Mm-hmm. So our infrastructure is already set up for our current and future realities, and I'm really proud that we keep moving in the right direction with regards to fire threat and danger. Okay, we are running a little short on time, and, and I want to talk. You talked about uh, development earlier, and development right. goes with public safety, and especially the fire piece of that. Um, and Colorado Springs has been known as development hungry uh, for for many years, right. uh, gobbling up, annexing, maybe growing faster than would make sense from a logical standpoint. What, what's your perspective on development and growth in Colorado Springs? You know, where the county is going to be a million people before long. Right. Um, maybe the biggest county in, in Colorado, in even more Colorado. than Denver County. Uh, right. What, what are we in for? And we're we're a big city. <laughs> we're no longer a small city. Yeah. Um, I, I I think the development conversation is is, is a multifaceted one because uh, we depend on on our developers to create communities and neighborhoods. And we talk about the housing conversation um, even as we approach attainable and affordable housing. Guess who has to do it? A developer. Mm-hmm. So we need them. <laughs> yeah. On one hand, we need them. I do think there's an area for greater collaboration between city and developers mm-hmm. to really uh, to really shape um, the development projects as well as shape the development conversation. I think the conversation, um, the, the the criticism, in many ways, it's fair, but I do feel like we also need to understand we need our developers. They're the ones that create communities and and, and neighborhoods, and I think the conversation must shift now from just development to actually the the humans mm. that these developments affect. Sure. So um, my desire for this pro-housing campaign is to, it's to talk about families. So we start with our military families. And by the way, Lieutenant General Clark and General Van Herc, mm-hmm. Um, General Van Herc is with uh, NORAD, U.S. Northcom. Mm-hmm. Lieutenant General is heads up the. He's a superintendent for the Air Force Academy. When I, in my meetings with them, when I ask them, "What do you need from the city?" They said, "More housing for our military mm-hmm. members." Okay, we have. That's where we. That's our starting point. That's where our starting point is, and then we figure out how development can support 
those deliverables. So we're working in tandem. And the last part of this uh, conversation is, as well as the city is also stepping up in our conversations and our deliverables around the much needed infrastructure. We need to do a better job of what we're doing as well as the work that still needs to be done. Yeah. So for example, 2C, John Southers and the previous administration gets a lot of credit mm -hmm. for 2C. For a city our size, we have one of the smallest budget. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the money. We're fairly conservative in our taxes. That's okay, we can be creative. Mm -hmm. John Southers helped solve that with this 2C tax ballot measure that now we can get ahead of our road infrastructure and our curbs and gutters and mm -hmm. sidewalks and make them ADA compliant. It's important to, for our, uh, the listeners to recognize that that sunsets in 2025. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be coming back to them to say, we need that infrastructure to ensure that we are keeping up with the growth of our city. And by the way, let me tell you what we've done with your money. Mm. And by the way, we've had we've seen a reduction in calls to the city ninety percent since we started doing those two C roadway road imp imp um, improvements um, in twenty twenty five and for, in twenty twenty four. Hopefully in November, going to the to the residents who asked for their support and their approval of this, I'll be also making a case that it's not just our roadways, mm -hmm. our bridges. So these are the continued steps that we need to take to ensure that. City government is doing our part to keep up with the growth of our city because that's what the residents want to know and they're asking me about. Let's wrap up with this one. Um, by most metrics, you know, Mayor John Southers was a, a pretty popular mayor, uh, won two terms, and it wasn't too difficult for him. So right. what do you take away from his administration and what is going to differentiate you from what Mayor John Southers did? Right, I... John and I are, are very different leader, leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I have tremendous respect for what he's done. I, um, to his credit, if I need him, I've reached out two or three times since I've assumed office, and he picks up the phone. Um, he's a great sounding board, and I think that's just good governance and good politics, sure. where we're we're working together. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can be different, but we can still, we both love the community. I was going to say, he's still interested he still in seeing loves it succeed. City. Right? He really does. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really admire with his leadership is, and you see that continue with me, He, un he John understood what he signed up for. There are many need, there are many inquiries, there are many demands on my on my schedule and my, and what, what the job of a mayor is, including people pulling me into school board matters. I, I or don't, podcast studios. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> but I have to do that balance. Yeah, yep. podcast. Um, and by the way, this is great because I love getting to the more technical um, interviews. And I just haven't had, the, this is probably the as technical as I've gotten since I started the job. So thank you for this opportunity. Oh, yeah, thank you for joining us. But I, I would say that John, yeah, John was a very technical leader. He understood what he signed up for. He understood the job description. You know, um, even though I'm pulled into a million directions, the three direct services that I should be measured, that you should be measuring upon on, in terms of how well I did my job mm -hmm. is around my ability to deliver on public safety, keeping our community safe, um, maintaining our aging infrastructure, as well as caring and keeping our parks safe. Those are three things by city code and by law. Everything else I do is indirect. They're really important. John's ability to understand that mm -hmm. and to lean into that and to say, okay, we need to take care of our roads. We need to take care of our stormwater infrastructure. We need to take care of our parks. He just understood what he signed up, signed up for. And I have a clear, similar clear understanding of what I signed up for. And the reason why that's important it allows me as a leader to prioritize you know, if you aim for everything, you aim for nothing. Mm. So what is my scorecard? What am I going to be measured upon? Not the amount of podcasts, which even though I like this, <laughs> or speaking engagements mm -hmm. that I did. People are not going to vote for me and say, uh, again, for real election and say, yeah, Yemi did 100 um, podcasts or 2,000 speaking engagement. No, it's going to be my ability to deliver, number one. Yep. Number two, so this is what makes John and I different. So that legacy will continue. Mm. Let's get 
shit done, if I can say that. No, this is the end. You can say that. Okay. (laughs) Let's let's get shit done. Mm -hmm. Okay, number two is, and I think this is where John and I are most different. The job also requires, I talked about the three public, public safety, public park, and public works, public Mm -hmm. infrastructure. There's a fourth public, public leadership. Mm. And I'd say I'm... I'm bringing in renewed um, emphasis to that part of the job. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that looks like for me is to ensure that the table, the mayor's table, from a public perspective, is accessible. Mm-hmm. The reason why I have the mayor's office of community affairs, not only are we at that size of a city where we need that, but the wisdom around that office is to bring the mayor's office to the people. Right to the neighborhoods, to the different cultural activities, to the faith communities, to, you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So we're bringing its public leadership and our residents deserve and they rightfully so should have a voice and should be able to engage the mayor. So that language as a candidate where people call me the people's mayor, that's how I would be leading as the people's mayor. It's what our city needs, yeah. especially as we're dealing with all these pain points. They want to feel like they're, they're heard, mm-hmm. and I'm here to hear you. And it helps to have a customer service background, too, from a business perspective. Yeah. So I will be bringing that hospitality into the mayor's office. We'll have to talk about the small business component of your, your background know. at the next yeah, podcast. Yeah, next, next one. Yeah, yeah I know yeah. we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we appreciate you coming, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Uh, we, we know you're a busy guy. and uh, I appreciate, appreciate this. Um, I, I already said it, but there's, some, there's something life-giving about just under the hood. Yeah. Yeah, let's go under the hood. Let's talk through each one of these. So thank you for the gift of yep. being able to um, say what I'm doing. Yeah, hopefully yeah. we can do this again soon. We will. All right. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening to Indie Inside. While we're focusing a lot of our energy right now into building the Indie and the Colorado Springs Business Journal, we'll podcast whenever we can. And you've probably heard we're also a nonprofit news organization now. To make this work, we're counting on you to become a supporting member. Please visit csnd.com join and do your part to see this important community service continue.